Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening. My name is Lynn, and I'm an alcoholic. What an experience it's been already, this Texan hospitality is just wonderful. Thank you for welcoming me as I'm a member of your family. And I want to thank the committee who've been working, preparing this for us. They worked all year, and to me they are the true heroes of Alcoholics Anonymous, doing the work behind the stage, uh, quietly but diligently, so we can be together this weekend and enlarge our spiritual life in working with others so that we can uh, follow through the low spots and the trials ahead. So thank you so much for giving me a commitment in Alcoholics Anonymous. I love to pepper my calendar with those commitments. They make me feel anchored and safe in my sobriety. Uh, I must tell you that uh, I have known uh, Betty Bell, and I want to thank her specifically for calling me throughout the year. Uh, We met in a woman's retreat three years ago in Salado, and she was an al speaker, and I was a, an AA speaker, and we shared the room. And so it's time to retire in the evening, and uh, she was telling me how her feet hurt, so I offered her a foot massage, and she was telling the story to a group yesterday, and she thought, this is so strange, a woman who doesn't know me and she wants to massage my feet. And so finally she let me in and massage her feet. And the other part of the story was that afterwards she said, by the way, I hope you don't mind, but I got my gun. (laughs) Now, I thought that was strange. (laughs) And so um, we are two people mentioned in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous who normally would not mix. I give massages and she packs heat. (laughs) And so uh, there was a gift on my bed last night uh, from Betty that I must share with you. And I'm just just absolutely thrilled. (laughs) So I'm packing. (laughs) And in spite of those delightful differences, what brings us together this weekend is alcoholism. And uh, I want to welcome all of you to Alcoholics Anonymous, especially the newcomers. And in case some of you might think that perhaps there is something special about me or that I'm going to impart you with some kind of wisdom, I would like to dispel all those myths. (laughs) I have no idea what I'm doing up here tonight, especially in the presence of those of you who have carried the message in this conference for over 30 years, beating down the path for us so we can be sober and or serene tonight. Uh, A few months ago, my husband and I attended a Saturday night meeting, and I was asked to be the 10-minute speaker. And I walked up to the podium, and I had painful blisters under my feet. It was hard to walk. And I told them that the night before, we were going to the couples meeting, which is AA and Al Anon. And we had a fight in the car. And so he stopped the car at the on-light ramp on the freeway, And I decided to get out and walk home. Now, I started with high heels and socks, then socks, then barefooted. It took me an hour and a half. Now, I had money and a cell phone, and I could have hailed the cab, but I wanted to show him. (laughs) And so if this was a group of normal people... They would have thought, wow, how long has she been sober? But this is Alcoholics Anonymous, so I was invited back to be the main speaker. (laughs) So I don't know why I'm here, 
And if some of you, one you, are concerned that maybe you're not good enough for us, the bar is set very low. <laughs> In fact, if you're not careful, you might walk right over it. <laughs> So anyway, I'm just so very grateful for the life that you have given me because I come from a place of darkness, very dark. As far back as I can remember being three, four, five, six years old, I was afraid. I was afraid of my parents. I was afraid of the dark, very insecure. I had a nervous condition. I did not fit anywhere. I was afraid that I was not lovable, that I was not wanted. I started kindergarten and it just got worse. I knew the little girls didn't like me. They all seemed to be so congenial and friendly with each other, but I was just an outsider everywhere I went. And when I was 13 years old, I went to this little party, bought six beers, and before I was halfway through the first one, all those fears went away. And it was comfortable and warm in my gut where I live. I had found the answer to my living problem. I was jolly with the little girls. I couldn't care less what they thought of me. Uh, we had such a wonderful time. I uh, blacked out. I went to get my last beer, and they told me my best friend Susan drank my beer. I found Susan, and I slapped her in the face. This was my first time out, and that's not social drinking. I drank for 14 more years the same way. I'm always overshooting the mark. I don't know what it means to have a drink or two. I have no interest in having a drink or two. I drink for the effect. I drink because without it, I'm uncomfortable with you. And I'm uncomfortable alone. As a teenager, I thought, well, if only I had a good education, maybe I could be happy like they look to be happy. And uh, I proceeded to obtain a license to practice law. And I just drank more. And I was in Quebec, Canada then. And I thought, well, if only I went to California, I'd be happy. I came here and I drank more. If only I had a young, handsome boyfriend, I'd be happy. We drank together. He proceeded to acquire the big house and the Porsche and the motorhome and the fast boat, and I drank more. If only I had a cleaning lady, I'd be happy. I got one, and I supervised her work with a hand in my hand. With a drink in my hand, my outside circumstances are totally irrelevant. I drink because I'm an alcoholic. And once I begin to have that first drink, it sets off that phenomena of craving that is beyond my power, always was, always will be. And it wouldn't be so bad if it was just a craving, because then all I have to do is not take the first drink. But I happen to have an obsession of the mind. My mind insists on drinking. So I was doomed when I was 13 years old when I started having that first beer. And I'm not sure why that relationship with that boyfriend didn't work out, except one time I slept with his best friend. Now, I did not even like his best friend. <laughs> But see, I was in a bar, and I was too drunk to get home, and he was the man next to me. And so when he said, well, I'll take you home, you'd think something like that would have occurred to me. Lynn, you are emotionally unemployable. You are an illegal alien. All your family is in Quebec, Canada. You're alone here. The only people who still tolerate you are his friend. He's finally supporting you. None of that came to my mind. I said, okay. I had to finish my drunk at any price. And the next morning, his girlfriend found us, and she was my boyfriend's secretary. So that was kind of tacky. And... Uh, <laughs> Three days later, I got a phone call from her, and she said, uh, all your stuff has been put in trash bags. You can come and pick that up in the office. And I was so afraid to go there, and I felt about this call. Um, I picked up my stuff, and I rented a room in a sleazy two-bedroom apartment. I slept in a sleeping bag on the floor, and all my clothes were on the floor, and I lived like an animal. 
I was a bar drinker, and you can only imagine what I was getting in bars at that time, and brought those home, and hopefully they wouldn't go into that room and see my sleeping bag on the floor. I lived with so much shame and degradation, and I was so alone, so dark, and I had no hope because drinking was the only answer I always had. And now it was causing me all these problems, but not to drink was inconceivable to me. I had to drink. And so the only answer I had was to find my way back into that house. I had no self-esteem, no self-worth, no sense of responsibility. I had no concept about relationships whatsoever. And I had learned how to resell Mexican tiles, and he had lots of those in his beautiful home. So I called him and I said, hey, I will redo your tiles for free. And he accepted that. So the next morning, after drinking some vodka, I showed up at his door uh, with the grubbies and the chemicals and the knee pads and good morning. And he let me in and I started to scrub the floors. He went to work and I proceeded to get drunk. And he came home after work and asked me to leave his house. And I was so ashamed of the way that I lived that that night I didn't want to go to that little room because maybe that roommate might be there and might see me and how I live and what I had become. So I slept in my car and I came to in the morning and I drank some more vodka and went back to that house, good morning, and I started to scrub those floors. But that day they were having a party. They were going to play tennis in the backyard. So the friends began to arrive and they'd say, I win and go on. These were the people who had attended my fancy dinner parties. I had been welcomed into their home for special events, but that day I was not wanted. And to top it, here comes that guy that I had slept with. Hi, Lynn. I wanted to dig a hole. And I was not one of those who wanted to come out, even after 68 days. You know, just let me in there. I did. I just wanted to hide. And um, that afternoon, everyone left, and I found myself alone with that man who had loved me, who had wanted to marry me. I was on the floor, and he was on top of me, having sex with me, trying not to touch me. And I'll never forget the look of utter disgust and contempt in that man's eyes looking down at me. And I left his home that afternoon because he asked me. And I went back to that little place and I binged all weekend, but what happened to me that weekend is that alcohol stopped working. I was sober from the neck up no matter how much I drank. So on Monday morning, I called Alcoholics Anonymous, and the gentleman said, so you want to stop drinking? And I said, no, 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 no. I just want to learn how to have five or six and then stop. (laughs) It's after that that I get in all this trouble. (laughs) He said, well, you're not ready for us. When you want to stop drinking, you call us back. And he hung up. Well, I must tell you, if you are new, that the day that Alcoholics Anonymous hangs up on you is a bad day. (laughs) We truly are the last house on the block. (laughs) And so over the next couple of hours or so, it settled down. And I remember either thinking, feeling, or hearing, Lynn, this is your last drink. You're done with drinking. There is nothing left in this for you. And that was June 21st, 1982, and it has been true so far. And so I called back Alcoholics Anonymous, and he said, great, this lady will call you back. And she did, and we talked, and she said, would you like to go somewhere? I thought, well, yes, I'm a traveler. I love going places. And I imagined they would take me to the La Costa Resort, and this was like $3,000 a week at the time, and I could use the massages, the mud bath. I was tired. And so I eagerly accepted the proposition, and she said, great, my husband and I will pick you up in 20 minutes, pack a few clothes. And so I did that, and they took me to detox downtown. (laughs) And her name was Beverly. And she and her husband, they stayed with me because I was so drunk, and you have to sober up for about four hours. 
and I had nothing, I had no money, and so I asked if I could borrow from her $5, and I wrote her a check, which she refused, and I still have that check today with my last drunken signature. And about a year and a half later, I um, went to a meeting, and my sponsor was talking to this lady whom I didn't know, but the sign of the voice was vaguely familiar. And so I approached my sponsor, and I said, hi. And this lady looked at me, and she said, are you Lynn? I said, yes. She said, my husband and I took you to detox. And she said, you know, I had been sober at the time for about nine years, and it never occurred to me to take anybody to detox. But you said something about having a rich boyfriend, and I thought, if she goes back to that house, she's not going to make it. And I have not thought of taking anybody else to detox since. And when I was six months sober, I had sent her her $5 back. And she said that when they received that at home, she and her husband had been having financial difficulties, and they had their priorities out of order. And when they received that check, they both cried sitting at the edge of the bed, and they said, you know, this is what's really important. And they bought a plant with my $5, and they knew as the plant grew that I grew too. And so I want to thank all of you who answered the phone for Central Office. You literally saved my life that day, and I am forever so grateful. Um, Bonnie, who said thank you for us uh, using our weekends to come here? No, this is upside down. <laughs> I owe you my life. There is nothing I can do enough of to repay you, ever. Not only that, but I want to be with you. I want to be of service. I love you. I love to share my life with you. You're just so beautiful, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. And so... I um, was in detox for about 10 days, then went to a recovery house for alcoholic women. I had a lot of problems, a lot of problems. And I've been sober for 28 years, and even like six months ago, I was still getting out of the car. So I'm just trying to live my life out there (laughs) on a daily basis using all the tools available to me. And in spite of that, I still get in a lot of trouble. And my sober life has been such an adventure. Uh, if you are new, hold on tight. This is the roller coaster of your life. But you know, this roller coaster that was divinely imagined for each and every one of us is very safe. Each curve, each detour is perfect for each and every one of us to get what we need to be able to use our skills and talent to be of service. So it is a roller coaster, but it's very safe, provided I keep myself right smack in the middle of this thing and stay very active in Alcoholics Anonymous, like all those examples that I saw at that meeting last night who've been coming here for over 30 years. Um, in my fifth year of sobriety, One morning, I came to, and I was just like in a little ball under the blanket, and I was filled with fear. Thank you so much, sir. I felt worthless. I had still very low self-esteem. I had lost hope that I could ever have a good life like you do. I was just filled with fear under that blanket, and I didn't want to go. I just didn't want to go. And you taught me to just go to a meeting anyway, and I did. And then I went to that little job. In spite of all my effort, I couldn't find a good job. And I'm just angry, punching those numbers in the computer, angry with God. You know, you take care of all those other little kids. How about me? I thought maybe, you know, being an illegal alien for all those years, he lost my file somewhere. Or, you know, everybody's going to Europe. They're getting married. They have children. Nothing is happening to me. So after that day, I went to the beach to be quiet. And again, what I either felt or thought or heard was, my child, you have been sober for five years. This is your primary purpose. I love you and I'm pleased with you. And to carry the message to others, which you have done to the best of your ability whenever requested. 
I love you. And I'm pleased with you. And you know, it all dissipated. This is my most honest third step ever. And I went to a little meeting afterwards, and I was asked to lead the meeting, and you know, we went on, and everything was fine. And two weeks later, I got a new job and doubled my salary, and I literally had holes in my shoes during those times. And so uh, the conference title, I think, is Don't Wait Before the Miracle Happens. Imagine if I had drunk between those two weeks, I would have missed it, and somebody else would be here tonight. Uh, so thank you so much for being at all those meetings for us. And when I was about 16 years sober, I had another very difficult period. Uh, I was still insecure, low self-esteem. And this is in spite of going to lots of meetings, being sponsored, sponsoring, taking the steps every day. This is really today the best Lynn that I can be. I put so much effort into this but I still had a lot of emotional problem. I come from a sick family, and it was taking a long time. And in my 16 year, I got my first real job with lots of people. And what I know is, if I'm mad at you or if you hurt my feelings, I don't talk anymore. I cannot have the conversation. And so very soon, there were four people I didn't want to talk to. So that's a lot of hallways that I'm afraid to go in. And... Um, I just had no tools, and then I get a call from my parents, and they said, we're going to come and spend a month with you. I hung up the phone. My throat was parched. I was shaking. I was cold. I thought, oh, my goodness, there is no way I can do this. And so I called my sponsor, and I said, there is no way I can be with my parents. I can't do this. And she said, well, honey, you have choices. You can invite them to your home, you can suggest a hotel, or you can say no. And so um, I prayed about it, and I thought, usually it's me going over there, wanting to get their approval. And this time they're coming here, maybe God has a hand in this, and maybe this is not about me this time. And since I was already doing a four-step over these people at work, I threw my parents in there. And it was amazing what I discovered. Uh, first, I was still angry with them for the way they raised us. I still had this resentment. I had a sickening feeling of superiority towards them. And, of course, they sensed it when I talked to them. I was still afraid of my mom's silences and my father's criticisms, so I was a doormat with them, and they knew it, and they took advantage of it. So this was quite of a stew going on here for all those years. And so I finished my first step. I called my sponsor, and I said, all right, they're going to be here in two weeks. We have to meet to do my fifth step. That will give God about ten days to remove enough of my defects. <laughs> So they will have a good time, and I really meant this. And so I put lots of love in the house, and I bought his favorite chocolates and her favorite flowers, and I went to pick them up at the airport, came to hug my mother, and she recoiled from me, as she always does. But before, it would hurt my feelings, and it was just a matter of time before we had a fight. This time, what I thought was, Lynn, she's filled with self-loathing. She does not want to be touched by anybody. It rolled off my back. We came home. My father criticized the carrots. And Lynn, you're going to have to address this. But I was still too afraid. Then he criticized the coffee. I said, you know, Dad, I don't like criticism. I'm going to let Mom cook for you. I have yet to cook for that man again. By the third day, my father said, Lynn, you have changed so much, I can hardly recognize you. You are so beautiful. And two days later, my mom is on the couch. I'm laying, I have my head on her lap, and she was caressing my hair. This is the transforming power of Alcoholics Anonymous. God within us, working through us, that was another miracle that I'm so glad that I didn't miss. And then, feeling pretty good, and I'm about 20 years sober, and I got bored with the meetings. And so far, the first year of my sobriety, I attended a meeting a day. The following 19 years, it was four meetings a week, two regular where I had commitments, and two free-floating 
And since I'm changing meetings, I don't have commitments. And within about a month or two, I was down to two or three meetings from four meetings. And Monday night was always a meeting night for me. So this particular night, I thought, you know, it's cold. Monday, 6 o'clock, Tuesday, 6 o'clock, same thing, I'll go tomorrow. Well, how cold does it get in California? And so the following Monday, it was raining. I thought, well, I don't need to go, and I started to count, and I had not gone to a meeting in 10 days. It took about three and a half months for me to come to that place. So that Monday night, I went to the meeting anyway. I raised my hand. I told them what was happening. They were having some election, and I became the treasurer. <laughs> and on Thursday, I went to the woman's meeting. I raised my hand. They made me the cookie lady. <laughs> and I was back in business. The best guarded secret of Alcoholics Anonymous, I think, is commitment to always have commitment. And those of you who have been coming here for 30, 33 years, these are the example of commitments you are teaching me. When we have commitments, we go to meetings, and somehow we go through the low spots and trials ahead, and we get to stay sober through that, to always have commitments in Alcoholics Anonymous. So I think that, to me, complacency is the most dangerous word for us with this disease. Um, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. If you are new this evening, make sure you get the big book. Do we have, <coughs> excuse me, big books for sale at this conference? We should? I think we do. If not, come and see one of us and we'll give you our copy. I love the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's by far the most important book that I have ever read. And I believe everything in it, except on page, is it 32 or 33, it said that we were rocketed into the fourth dimension. And, well, I was not rocketed anywhere. So I sort of resent the idea that I was more like, I was more like oozed into that dimension, you know, over a period of 10 to 15 years of squeezing in there. <laughs> but what are my options? Uh, and then if you're reading the big book, you may want to get a sponsor because it can help answer a question. And you know, sponsors, we know little tricks that usually you don't hear at the podium. And um, that big book's got all sorts of neat, neat things in it. Like on, I think it's page 132, 133 on bottom and the left, the other side, it says that all alcoholics should always have chocolate by their side for a quick fix of energy. So I always have chocolate by my side. And then it talks about prayer in a way that's very disappointing. It says that we are not to pray for selfish things. Well, darn. Well, I found a little way around this. A few years ago, I wanted a new motorcycle. So I asked a girlfriend of mine to pray that I get the motorcycle. <laughs> and I got it. <laughs> <laughs> I was in Cocoa Beach three or four weeks ago, and I told that story, and there was this lady in the audience who had this Harley, and she came up to me, she said, you want to go for a ride? <laughs> and so we went riding that motorcycle for three or four hours, and little did I know that she was two and a half years clean, sober, and she was entertaining the thought of smoking pot because drug was not a problem for her. So my just wanting to go for a motorcycle ride turned out to be a four-hour, 12-step call. And it was just such a wonderful thing. <laughs> so Hannah promised me to get a sponsor, and I told her by next Wednesday at that meeting, you're supposed to get your sponsor, and if I don't have an email from you that night, I'm calling you Thursday morning, and I did get that email that she got a sponsor. And so uh, it's, 
You know, before I got sober, my life was so narrow. I was sleeping in that sleeping bag, and I was going to that bar, and this was my life. And we were talking about that with Paul and Christine today, and how today we know people all over the United States and some countries in the world, and the phone rings, and we connect even with heat-backing ladies. I mean, you know, it doesn't matter. I just feel so grounded. I belong to this world with you, together, connected, feeling the oneness, God's love and God's omnipotence. Uh, we pray and we meditate, and Gail, I really enjoyed the session this morning, but I thought she was not very honest. She should have uh, been a little bit more forthcoming. She just said something like, um, well, now you close your eyes and be still. Huh? When I started meditating, I was about three years sober, and my sponsor had said 20 minutes. And so I put little spiritual images on the walls, and I had incense burning and candles and um, kitchen timer in 20 minutes, and I crossed my legs and sat on the floor. Then I heard a fly buzzing around, and then I started to think about that jerk and what I would tell him next time I saw him, and I heard the humming of the refrigerator, and I began to salivate, thinking about the ice cream I would have afterwards, and then my shoulder was itching, but you can't scratch it because you can't move, and then I began to worry about how much how much money I owed for the rent, and this was due in three weeks, and my goodness, if I don't get another job, and then my leg was going numb, I opened my eye, and it'd been a minute and a half. <laughs> so those of you who could not be still this morning, <laughs> join the rest of us. <laughs> I had another meditation about three or four months ago. And that morning it was, what is God? Please speak to me, I'm here. It was quiet. I heard the birds, followed with, I am those birds. And it put a big smile on my face in silence. Then one of my little dogs started to bark, followed with, I am that dog. Wow, God is loving me through the verse of the dogs. Followed with, and I am John. <gasps> whoa, 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 whoa. That's my husband. <laughs> and I reflected upon that. Uh, yes, God is John, but John is not God. <laughs> See, God is loving you through me and is loving me through you. We live in a very friendly universe, and there was 25 years between those two meditations the transforming power of this loving God. But it was 25 years. Um, I don't know where I could have been so transformed coming from the place that I spoke of. I feel secure, I feel confident, I can forgive, I have love in my heart most of the time, uh, enough to marry someone. You know, I'm a fling kind of a girl. And lovers come and go, and that's the most wonderful thing about them. You know? And so, at the age of 53, I married for the first time. And my husband, well, he comes over every night. I wake up in the morning, he's still there. 
day after day after day. Husbands have nowhere to go. Nobody told me. And I happen to be a solitary person. It's my nature. That's why I haven't lived with anybody in my sobriety. I'm content by myself. I need space. But I wanted to marry that man, and this has been a pretzel. I spent the second year of our marriage angry and disappointed. I went on a dry drunk, if you will, because I have very little emotional sobriety. I would be so mad. I would call my sponsor, guess what he did? I can't believe, guess what he did? She said, honey, he made a mistake. You are reducing this to being a mistake. I know this should be in a code written somewhere. This is premeditation. How could this possibly be happening to me? She said, honey, there is nothing you can do about that. So you don't understand. This is not happening to me again. She said, honey, you have to accept this. This is unacceptable. She said, honey, we have ceased to fight everyone and everyone, but he's wrong. <laughs> And I would be so mad, and it'd be like the fireworks inside of me, and I'd be pacing the place back and forth. It had no place to go. It's amazing. I never thought of drinking being married. I went through this sober. This is another miracle. And I would just go to work anyway and not pray. And that particular day, the answer was, from God, a romantic weekend. A place at the beach, lots of meetings, long walk, very spiritual, you and the dog. So I went online and I found a little motel, hotel, where they accepted little dogs, and I was going to go home, leave him a note, loving late, we'll see you Sunday nights. And I was going to take Misty with me, we were going to go by the beach and just hang. Well, I made a mistake of calling my sponsor, and... Um, Sponsored, it's a great thing, but you, you have to explore all avenues before calling them. They're just too unpredictable. So I called her, and she said, no, no, no. It's the couple's meeting tonight. I said, I'm not going. I'm not going. She said, Lynn, if you want to be married, you have to act like a married woman. You're going to that meeting tonight. Well, I'm not driving with them. You just take your own car. Well, I'm not sitting next to him. You sit next to him just like all the other couples. Well, I'm not sharing. If I share, it's going to be nasty. You don't have to share. And I went to the meeting with my own car, and I sat next to him, but my body as far away as I possibly could, so they would all know how mad I really was. And I stayed married that day, and I stayed sober that day. And this is what this program requires of me. I often have to take direction, take actions that are totally contrary to what I really want to do. And so here we were in the disappointment. And I thought, if I'm disappointed, it's because he's not enough. Well, I took an inventory on that. And what I found out was, although I have five siblings, it's only about me that my parents said with Lynn, it's never enough. It's never enough. And when she wants something, she has to have it. If you had told me how selfish, self-seeking, and frightened I still was at 26 years of sobriety, I would not have believed you because of all the things we do. But there it was. So the answer in my life, practicing these principles in all my affairs, and my marriage certainly is an affair, is to take the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and to call my sponsor and to take the direction to the best of my ability. My mind has a mouth of its own. One morning, 
I overhear him make plane reservation for a trip I didn't know about, and it just ticked me off. Now, normally, we're very independent. We have a lot of freedom, but it just it just turned me the wrong way. And so um, I pick my cell phone. I make one of those call your sponsor before you talk to him phone call. And now I'm outside pacing, and <laughs> she said, honey, this is no big deal. This is nothing. <laughs> she said, Lynn, he's been divorced 11 years. You've never been married. You're both learning. This is no big deal. <laughs> well, all right. He was a little bit inconsiderate, but I don't want you to go in there and take 15 minutes and present a case to the Supreme Court. All right, all right. Can you just sweep, short, two sentences? Yes, say something like, Honey, I happen to have overheard you, and next time I'd appreciate and I love you. Of course I can say that. And I practiced a couple of times and said, All right, yeah, no problem. And I love you, and next time I'd appreciate And I'm already feeling superior to him, because I know he can't do that. And I'm feeling all grown up. And I'm saying it to myself three, four times. I get to the house, open the door, and say, Honey, where were you? I was talking to my sponsor, and she said, You're inconsiderate. <laughs> and that, of course, took me two weeks of work to get through this because it escalated, and we had more fights, and I was so tired of being married. <laughs> Just so tired. But... Because of strong sponsorship, a loving God, the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, lots of meetings, and my sponsee would call, and they hear me, you know, I say it to them the way it is, and I had enough place to share those feelings and enough wisdom imparted into me from you that somehow I'm still sober today and I'm still married, and I so love, love my life. Uh, I've been on trips. Um, I um, and one of them turned out to be something totally unexpected. My husband has two children from a previous marriage in their back east, and they were going to come over and spend a week. <laughs> <laughs> this is not my idea of a good time. <laughs> so I said, "Honey." How would you like some quality bonding time with your children? He said, sure. I said, why don't I go somewhere? He said, okay, where would you like to go? I said, Africa. <laughs> so I went online and I booked an organized tour for a safari to Kenya and Tanzania. I was the only North American. I met the group in Nairobi and it was the trip of a lifetime. And among other places that we visited, there was this Maasai village and the Maasai school. Very, very poor, poor children. Uh, their shoes, it's a piece of car tire strapped on their feet, and they go to school to get that bowl of beans. And that school is just bare walls, and there is no sign that anybody is helping anyone. And Mr. Mina, the school principal, with all his dignity, begged us three times to help with the lunch project. And there was only one person who put money in that box. And I thought, nobody is helping them. And you've taught me here to be useful and see, you know, if there is a need that I can meet. And God loves you through me, and I can love his kids, you know, him through me, and we live in a friendly universe. And so um, that little village is about a 30-minute drive from the camp where we were. And these people, they're walking or on bicycle, so it's quite a distance. And so um, I'm in the camp later that afternoon. i got to help them. i got to help them. So I talked to the organizer of the tour, and he said, just send us the money, and we'll make sure they get it, even if we can deliver it. And I thought, Right. And so um, I went to my tent, and I got on my knees, and I said, God, if it's my role to help them, give me a clear sign. Otherwise, I won't do it. I don't want to worry about this every month. And so 
I decided to go to the village and take a short walk. And as I'm coming back to camp, I'm about five minutes from getting up that sidewalk. Who comes straight at me on his bicycle? But Mr. Mina, the principal from that morning. So I had goose flesh all over. This is the miracle one more time. And um, I told him I wanted to send money for the lunch project. And so this is how it started. So I created my own foundation, a nonprofit, Mina's Kids. And my idea was to send $50 a month for the school project. And God's idea is that I raised $90,000 for a library and a computer room. And we're starting construction next week. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm supporting five orphans. Uh, they have access to free school till the seventh grade. And if they don't have $300 to go to the dormitory style eighth grade school, they are doomed to manual labor on small farms for the rest of their life. So, I have five of them in school. They're in ninth grade now, and they got bicycles last year. And the ladies of their village, they had this big celebration. Apparently, I'm the first one who's ever helped them, they tell me. And they offered me a citizenship to the society. So I'm a honorary member of the Maasai tribe. <laughs> From being, you know, in that sleeping bag on that floor, I don't know how that happened. And then I was sending the first installment through Western Union. And I'm not sharing that with you for accolades. This is the world of Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's just what we do. So I went to the Western Union counter, and it's a payday counter. And the lady, the cashier, was like 25 years old, and ear pierced, and beautiful, young, and on the other side of the glass. And then as I entered, there was this lady that I saw from the back. And she looked like she was maybe... 60 years old, or so, and there was no privacy. This is just a small rectangle room. And she had her paperwork on the ledger, and I heard her say, I have my bank statement, and this is my pay stub. And I'm still a temporary, but they offered me the full-time job. And the young lady said, well, I'm going to have to call the bank to make sure you're not in the negative. And she said, well, yes, we are. That's why I'm here but my husband will get his social security check on Wednesday, so we just need money for food and gasoline to carry us. And the young lady said, I can't help you. And my heart went out to that lady who was revealing this very private information to this young 25-year-old girl. I, my heart went out to her. And so as she walked away, I went up to her and I said, would you be embarrassed if I helped you? She said, huh? I said, I will help you. She said, you would? I said, yes. How much money do you need? She said, $100. So I get my checkbook, and she starts to cry, those big nickel-sized blue eyes. And she said, I will pay you. I said, no, no, in my world, we share. You don't need to. And she said, my husband has multiple sclerosis, and we just moved, and it cost us so much money. And... Uh, I said, how much do you really need? She said, 150 So I wrote the check. And she said, I will pay you. I said, no, just pass it on. You know, the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous. We exchanged a big hug. And I was telling my husband, I wish I were a little bird to have been in her home, the story she told to her husband when she got home. And this made me happy for days. I, I can't tell you. If you're new this evening, the love, the joy, the sharing, the closeness with other human beings that are just impossible when we're drinking like the way I did. I lived in isolation. I lived behind a wall. My walls did not start to come down until I was in my mid-teens in sobriety. Um, more so when I got married, that's in my early 50s. For some of us, it takes a long time. So I also want you to know that if you're not emotionally catching on, like some of you I know early in sobriety, but really close, they go to conference together, they're very comfortable with each other. But some of us, we come from another place. 
And it doesn't mean that we are bad or wrong or not working a good program or not that someday we will not reach that place where we're truly comfortable with other human beings. It just means that we have a little bit more to go. That's all. And if you're new, I want to welcome you again to Alcoholics Anonymous. This is the only thing that I know that can work for people like me. I beg you to keep yourself really, really close. And no matter how unpredictable, to get that sponsor, to have a phone list, to make the coffee somewhere. This is a life that you don't want to miss. Um, maybe you have gone so far down the scale that you may not believe that God or us will possibly possibly have anything to do with you, or perhaps you're going to something and you think it's simply insurmountable. If it is so, I would like to share a little story with you. A few years ago, I went to the pet store to buy food for my cat, and there was a rescue foundation there, and they had 12, 15 boys staring little dogs, and all looked pretty fluffy and happy except for one, Misty. Misty was five pounds, half her weight. Um, she was missing fur due to the malnutrition, she was not housebroken, she was filthy, coughing, wheezing, flakes coming off her skin. They had just found her she, near the border. She'd been homeless, and uh, she was petrified. She put her in that cage, and I passed by, and I put my hand in there, and she kissed it, and I started to cry. And I said, honey, you're coming home. We'll work it out. <laughs> Now, I pick my men the same way, but... <laughs> this is something else that Betty and I have in common. <laughs> and so I took that little dog home, and um, today... I can tell you that she goes to the beauty parlor on a regular basis. She has rhinestone collars and a little wardrobe, and she loves fresh salmon. Uh, I hired a carpenter to build a ramp so she can go up the bed while other people train their animals not to come to the bed. Um, she would bite my husband, and I told my husband, listen, if you want to sleep with us, we need a bigger bed. Uh, or you can keep your arms under the blanket. This is the place that Misty has had in that home. Well, in order for that pathetic nothing starving, nippy little dog on her way to be euthanized to have the life of the little princess that she has today. This is what this wondrous divine power had to orchestrate for her. It took the lady who found her near the border, who brought us to the pound, the people at the pound who were there to receive her, Penny, the president of the Rescue Foundation who goes to the pound every day to collect those little dogs. Penny and the help of volunteers who go to PetSmart every Saturday to have the dogs adopted. Me, who passed by, who fell in love with that little dog. So if God could stoop so to save the life of that little dog, what do you think God will not do for any one of us? And if we were not <laughs> ourselves dejected, starving, emaciated, spiritually, emotionally, alone and rejected. I have good news if you are new. You have been scooped up. We are your adoptive family. I know we tell you to keep coming back, but I will tell you just stay. Stay here where it is safe and stay on a short leash. A sponsor, a phone list, meetings, the steps every day, conferences whenever you can, getting commitments, right smack in the middle of this thing where it is safe.
And I would like to leave you this evening with a prayer. My sobriety date is June 22nd, 1982, and it is the most important piece of information to know about me. This is the day that you so lovingly took me in, asking no questions. This is the day when this march with my higher power began. And my sobriety date is the gold nugget in my heart. And I don't wear it like a jewel on a crown or a feather on a panache, but as a very, very special treasure. And my prayer this evening is that all of us get to keep the sobriety date that we have today. And I so thank you for mine. Have a great time. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.